Thanks for coming tonight. I'm Ken Zimmerman. I'm the director of U.S. programs here at OSF. And in conjunction um, with the public health program and the women's rights program, it's uh, a pleasure to greet you all for a topic that could not be more topical, uh, public health in a populist moment. I mean, I'll just say that uh, I oversee the program that does uh, most of the grant making here at OSF in the United States. And I think what we've seen, frankly, in the past several weeks about the ways in which people have started to realize the significance of their rights potentially being taken away, especially around an issue as fundamental as their health care, is something in which, as this nation tries to respond to something close to the unimaginable, um, has resonance in a very powerful way. <coughs> Sometimes exactly where it goes is, of course, uncertain. So it's fantastic to have this presentation today. Um, and uh, I'm glad to be able to simply introduce the moderator, which is what I have about today. <laughs> so uh, Elizabeth Rosenthal goes by Libby. Um, thanks for having us. She's the editor in chief of the Kaiser Health News. Before joining Kaiser, she spent 22 years as a correspondent at the New York Times where she authored the prize-winning healthcare reporting series, Pain Till It Hurts. She's a graduate of Stanford University and Harvard Medical School, and briefly practiced emergency medicine before converting to journalism. Her book, An American Sickness, How Healthcare Became a Business, and How You Can Take It Back, will be published in April. Really, take it away. what we're going to do to begin with is we're each going to say uh, five minutes or so about what interests us on this particular topic and then uh, we'll have a moderated discussion. I'll ask the panel a bunch of my questions and then for the last half hour, 40 minutes or so, I'll throw it over to your questions. So um, I figured, uh, let me introduce our panel here. It's great because Everyone is coming to this discussion from a slightly different perspective, and uh, we're going to hear lots of uh, different concerns and hopes and aspirations for this uh, unusual moment in time. So first, on my left, is uh, Jonathan Cullen. He's the director of the Open Society Public Health Program. He joined uh, the Open Society in uh, 2006 as the inaugural director of the Law and Health Initiative supporting legal strategies to safeguard the health of socially excluded people. Um, he previously worked as a researcher with the HIV, AIDS, and Human Rights Program and Human Rights Watch, and he holds degrees from Yale, the University of Cambridge, and the University of Toronto Practice of Law. So, thank you for having me. On my right is uh, Chloe Cooney, who is the Director of Global Advocacy at Planned Parenthood Federation of America, where she launched and now leads Planned Parenthood's advocacy for U.S. leadership on international reproductive health and rights. Um, quite a task uh, at the moment. Uh, Chloe was previously a Vice President uh, with the Endeavor Group and has also worked with the Global Business Coalition on HIV AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria, and in the film industry. She's a graduate of Barnard College and um, is the wife of one of my colleagues <laughs> at Kaiser Health News. So, uh, and it's the first one I've met. Okay, um, so let's go. Um, uh, Na Hammond, who is there, is, uh, is a program officer at the Groundswell Fund, which supports the movement for reproductive justice in the U.S. She previously worked in research and communications with funders for LGB, uh, sorry, LGBTQ issues and fierce, a New York City-based organization that builds the leadership and power of LGBTQ youth of color. She's also worked with Queers for Economic Justice, the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, and the Urban Justice Center. She's a graduate of NYU and, and, and an advisor.
advisory board member of the Third Wave Fund. Um, we move to the very end there. Ronald Martin is a law enforcement safety advocate with the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition. Uh, he's a former detective sergeant of the New York City Police Department. Um, we were saying we, we are always New Yorkers, no matter how, how, how long we've uh, long we've not been here for. Um, he super there. He supervised narcotics teams, advised mayor's office, and worked with a range of law enforcement agencies. As a harm reduction advocate, he educates North Carolina police officers on needle stick and overdose prevention measures, and advocates for more dialogue between law enforcement and people who use drugs to create safer communities. As you all probably know, um, North Carolina is a state that did not expand the as Mark Meadows' home state. So, there you go. Um, and uh, finally, Greg Gonzalez is a research scholar at Yale Law School and assistant professor of epidemiology at the Yale School of Public Health and co director of Yale's Global Health Partnership. He's been a leading HIV AIDS activist for more than 20 years, uh, organizing with ACTA, the Treatment Action Group, Gay Men's Health Crisis and the AIDS and Rights Alliance for Southern Africa. And he was previously an Open Society Fellow and uh, received his PhD from Yale in 2016, which is an interesting story to just last year. Um, so I'm gonna start us off um, just kind of giving an overview of why this panel means so much to me and why I was so interested, even though um, my book publishers say, don't go talk anywhere two weeks before your book is coming out. <laughs> now this one I, I have to go through. So, um, you can see they, they make the case that I put some propaganda out. So. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is a really important issue to me as a former Times reporter and now someone at uh, Editor-in-Chief of Kaiser Health News. Um, I've been sitting in Washington, D.C. for the last uh, six weeks since inauguration. Um, and um, and I think what what <coughs> I was sitting in D.C. our offices between the White House and Congress last Friday watching the um, ACHA um, tank, um, and here we are. You know, here we are in a place where no one had anticipated um, the GOP the health plan uh, went down in flames. Um, uh, uh, Congressman Ryan, <laughs> um, Congressman Ryan um, says the ACA is the law of the land for the foreseeable future, although um, they tried to kind of backtrack on that today, but we'll see. Um, and so, uh, you know, as I said to my staff in D.C., now we all have a chance to kind of reset and rethink and maybe move forward in, in uh, some ways that a week ago seemed a little more like the sky is falling and wouldn't be possible. Because I think one of the things we learned from the experience, or I learned from the experience of uh, the last election, is that populism matters, um, that what people think on the ground and what their experience of on the ground, and particularly with something like healthcare, which is such a personal issue, matters to everyone. And politicians manage to turn that into a right versus left issue, but it's, it's it's a much more intimate issue than that, and I think what we've seen is in the campaign, um, the, the Trump um, uh, candidacy and, the, and President Trump managed to harness that populism uh, in ways that people didn't really understand to, um, to get the votes he needed to become president. But now I think what we're seeing in these town hall meetings, which I think really helped upset the hopes of the GOP in getting any of their bills passed, is that a lot of those same people are realizing, hey, you know, this promise and what he was talking about really affects me. I, I, I'm gonna lose my health care, or I'm gonna have my premiums or my deductibles are going up. So I think we've both seen how right-wing populism could be, or the populism, which is kind of, I want to say party neutral on the ground, um, can be harnessed for um, <coughs> ways that are not entirely honest, or can be harnessed for the good. And, and uh, I think that's really an important force to recognize, and I think it, uh, to me, one of the lessons of 
this election, uh, this last election, was nobody was, the, the, the Democrats in particular weren't paying enough attention to that. Um, so anyway, here we are talking about how populism has affected different parts of our healthcare uh, system. I have been, um, at my own story, I was at the New York Times for 22 years. Um, I came to the New York Times, ironically, um, from practicing as an emergency medicine doctor and being a freelance writer, I came there full time to cover the, uh, more closer, sorry, uh, cover the um, effort, at, the Clinton effort at health, health reform. Um, my assumption when I came to the Times to do that was that that would happen in, in a couple of years or a year, and then I would go back to being a doctor. And of course, um, a lot of things happened that I never did. So um, I think you know one of the messages for me is that we all really need to think of how healthcare Healthcare is a populist issue and is an issue for every person. Uh, part of the reason it hasn't been expressed that way is because most of us and most people we know open bills at their in their living room. They're frustrated. They're angry. Uh, they get turned away from a treatment program. They can't get the medicines they need, and they do their best to solve that individually. Um, and if they do. You know, they may or may not succeed. Um, if they don't, they feel bad about themselves often and are very frustrated and get sick. If they do, they think, wow, that was a nightmare to have to do all that stuff and move on with their lives. But they, they have really no way to kind of, we, we haven't found a good way to harness that into a populist <coughs> patient movement, which is, I think, what's really sorely lacking in uh, this country right now. Um, you know, there's a natural coalition, as I said, it's not left or right, it's people who, for whom this uh, current health system and public health system isn't working very well. Um, and when the Clinton Health Bank Plan was being proposed, I, I thought that was, um, having worked in an emergency room, I thought that was a subset of Americans. Now I don't think the system is working very well for anyone. And I think that's, that makes it pretty right for a kind of populist change. Um, anyway, um, but more on that uh, from our panelists and later. Um, so to me, healthcare should be inherently a grassroots issue, which it kind of hasn't been. I mean, except for groups like ACT, ACT UP, when, when uh, HIV AIDS first became an issue, ACT UP did an amazing job of turning health and public health into a public issue. But, you know, most of our groups are so diverse and, you know, everyone has their own disease and they and we haven't figured out how to, to kind of unify. It's as if the condo owners don't work with the co-op owners, don't work with the renters. You know, everyone focuses on, I have migraines or I have diabetes or I have, and, and they don't see what unifies them all, which is uh, a health and public health system that doesn't work very well. Um, so, um, I think, you know, now that we're at this juncture where we're not sure really if uh, the ACA will stay or will go, um, I'm doing a little soap, soapbox in here, um, I think it's really important for us all to keep our eyes on ways in which it is being um, kind of, I call it death by a thousand cuts. It's being uh, unraveled um, in ways that can happen uh, via regulatory measures or via not filling positions or non-enforcement. Um, I think that's a big issue. You know, will the Republicans now say, we're gonna try and make this work or we're gonna try and make sure it doesn't work? Um, and I think that's something we really have to uh, keep our eyes on because I think one thing that the ACA did, whether it stays or it goes, is that it changed the, the Americans' notion of who's responsible for health and what we owe people. And so I think that's that was the, the Republicans. The hardest thing about that bill is people feel like now it is our responsibility to make sure people are healthy. We didn't do it very well, perhaps, for some people under the ACA, but it is our responsibility, and that's a hard thing to go back on. Um, you know, especially I was noticing, I don't know, you probably saw the article in the Times 
was yesterday about how Medicaid, once a kind of niche program, now covers with the expansion, now covers 70 million Americans. So um, that's a, a pretty <coughs> growing one. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of those people understood um, at, at the last presidential, presidential election what was at stake for their insurance. Um, so um, we're going to move on with the panel. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think populism, real populism, is, is really good for health care. Entering to populism is not. Um, and I think that's our challenge going forward is how does the populism we see from the right, which is powerful but um, not always honestly um, corralled and directed, uh, what, what have you, how, how do you deal with that in your particular area? And how do you harness that populism that's kind of party mm. neutral and growing up in response to the, the Republican efforts to repeal the ACA in positive ways? Um, I always like to, to uh, and I want to end this introduction with um, something I, the most interesting factoid I've learned when I was researching my book. Um, it was, uh, surveys in Canada about who was the most popular Canadian in history. And I, of course, thought it was going to be like uh, Wayne Gretzky or, uh, or, or Justin Bieber. And it was actually the physician who started Canada's national health program. So, um, uh, I don't, but, I think, but I think whoever gets a health program done for the U.S. Uh, public health system that really serves patients will be equally popular. So there we go. Um, I want to turn it over to each of our panelists, uh, Jonathan first, about um, what you do and how you see this the, the populism brewing out there affecting it. Well, Libby, thank you very much, and thank you, everyone. Welcome to the Open Society Foundations, and thank you especially, Libby, for describing a brand of populism that many of us can get behind. Um, I think I'm going to focus on the populism coming from the right. I think it's a very important phenomenon to try to describe um, and understand. And um, I'm glad that pets have been brought in. <laughs> I, I want to begin um, my, my discussion of this with an observation that um, is not very optimistic, nor I think is it very original, uh, which is that all over the world we are seeing uh, ordinary people, um, often in a great deal of economic and social distress, embracing poli policies and politicians who are plainly bad for their health. Um, and we can dismiss this as kind of reckless voting behavior, or we can attempt to really try to understand what's going on. I know that we will talk later in the panel about the epidemic of opioid dependence in the United States, but I think it's such a wonderful example of that, whereby you know, we see that the very policies that would help communities address this epidemic, whether it's an expansion of Medicaid and drug treatment, um, greater regulation of industry, curbing of strike hard law enforcement approaches are precisely those policies that the president elect uh, rails against, even though in many cases those policies pull well. Um, and the same is true outside the United States, right? So that we saw during the Brexit campaign um, a number of people from the Leave camp making this claim that. 350 million pounds a week in European Union dues uh, would be spent on the National Health Service um, once uh, Britain voted to leave. And this claim had immense popular appeal, but in fact, many of its most strident proponents were people who would sooner privatize the NHS than actually protect it or strengthen it. Um, we have a third extremely dramatic example now um, in the Philippines. Uh, where the very communities who would benefit, benefit from evidence-based um, approaches to drug treatment um, and who are seeing more mass murders in that country uh, than occurred during the, the Marcos era um, are claiming that President Duterte, who is overseeing this murderous drug war, is actually making them safer and, and rallying behind them. So it's, you know, it's this kind of chronic 
um, pattern of people voting, getting behind politicians who, who plainly are not acting in their best interest when it comes to health. And, and it's true that, that one can look at that and see an opportunity, right? You can look at that optimistically and say, all right, well, what we need to do um, is offer those communities a more progressive alternative. Um, harm reduction programs for communities hit by opioid dependence, um, strengthening the National Health Service, drug treatment in the Philippines, um, and hope that that will help them see that they're being sold a bill of goods by these right-wing populists. Um, and indeed, that insight undermines uh, much of what we're up to in the public health program and uh, the U.S. programs and the Washington office of the Open Society Foundations is trying to kind of capitalize on that insight and offer people a more progressive alternative that might even drive a wedge between them and the populist politicians that they supported. And I think we have reason enough to believe that often, as you've, you've given a great example from Canada, politicians who've embraced a real pro-health populism have become national heroes, not, not just you know, elected president, but true national heroes. We've seen that in, in my native Canada, uh, we've seen it in the UK, we've seen it in Germany, we've seen it in South Africa, we've seen it in Thailand, in Mexico, in Brazil. Universal health coverage is a winning populist strategy, right? I, I think that my, my optimism stops there. Um, and I, 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 the reason for that, um, although that is a lot of reason for optimism, granted, is that I, what I fear is that right-wing populists are actually tapping into something much deeper and much more elemental than what can be addressed through alternative policy prescriptions. And that it's not going to be as easy uh, as offering these communities um, progressive alternatives. And here's where I think we really have to unpack what populism is and what is on offer um, from these right-wing politicians. And I, because I don't think it's just a set of policies. In fact, it's not a set of policies, and it's certainly not a coherent set of policies. What it is, first of all, I think is a profoundly uh, anti-elitist stance. Um, and this purported concern for so-called ordinary people, so that, for example, the Brexit vote can be cast by UKIP as a victory for real people, right? As though the 48% of people who vote against it are not real people, right? And of course, these real people, these ordinary people, these decent folk, are often contrasted with minority populations whose causes in this analysis become elite causes, politically correct causes, but not kind of ordinary causes. So to the extent that kind of populism translates into health policy, it could certainly translate into very exclusionary health policy. I think the other thing that, that populists are offering to people is, is this kind of us and them stance, right? I mean, they're, they're offering an enemy. They're offering a deep hostility to political procedures, uh, to the establishment, to intellectuals. They are provoking, they're offering conflict. Um, and of course, you know, translated into health policy, I think that kind of conflictual um, us and them mentality is the opposite of what we need in health. It's the opposite of the social compact, right? Of the idea of solidarity, of, of looking out for each other. And it's also incredibly politically risky because in a way, if you've set up this us and them battle as a populist, you can't lose, right? So when Trump care tanks as it did on Friday, if you're Donald Trump, you can just say, well, it's a conspiracy against me. Um, it's elites keeping the ordinary people down, and so on and so forth. And it kind of gives you an excuse for your policy failures. Um, I think a third thing that, that populists, right-wing populists, are offering people um, is, is, is frankly a, a profoundly um, anti-pluralistic idea that this kind of monolithic will of the people ought to prevail over liberal institutions like the courts, the media, NGOs, and I think that's partly why we're so 
concerned about populism at the Open Society Foundations. I'm convinced that if you took all of our strategies, which we're writing now, and put them in a word cloud, populism <laughs> would just appear everywhere. And it, it's be, I think it's because it is, at its core, a deeply anti-pluralist idea. It goes against this idea of listening to multiple points of view and staking out a compromise. So that whatever you might think of Obamacare, um, as health policy, and I think many of us were not such great fans of it, what you can at least say is that it was a product of democratic deliberation. It was a compromise between multiple points of view, and I think populism limits this possibility of compromise. I think it's antithetical um, to this idea of, of compromise, or even to rational discourse in the first place. Um, and then finally, um, and Jonathan White um, has made this argument, I think that most dangerously what, what populists are offering people um, is a sense of agency and a sense of control in a deeply turbulent world where people feel profoundly powerless. You know, powerless in the face of globalization. Power, powerless in the face of, of neoliberalism, right? Powerless in the face of the austerity policies that were passed in Europe in response to the economic crisis. So that the motto of the Brexit referendum or the Leave camp could be take back control, right? So what we are offering you is control. Never mind whether this claim that your EU dues could be diverted back into the NHS makes any sense at all. Uh, never mind that the European Union, Union actually um, can have you know policies like disease surveillance that are good from public health for public health. What we're offering you is a sense of agency, um, a sense of control, a conflict, an enemy. And I guess um, you know not to start us off on too dire a note, but I'm a, I'm a little bit concerned that alternative policy prescriptions may not be a match for that particular offer. And I'm also concerned that that particular offer and that stance, that conflictual us and them mentality is in many ways even worse for public health than the policies um, that go along with it because they are, they're ultimately bad for democracy, right? Um, and here I am making an assumption that democracy is good for health, and that is something that is debatable, and maybe we should debate it, uh, but I'm concerned about democracy. And um, that's, yeah, that's how I think now about the, the connection between public health and populism. Okay, well, uh, that's gone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but perhaps realistic, and we'll be talking a lot more about that. Okay. Um, uh, well, I, I come to you today with some optimism, yeah. um, more optimism than I thought I was going to come to you today with um, when, when we started planning this conversation. So, uh, and I, I guess I'm going to think about populism in just the purest form of, of the word. Um, and which is to say, I think my thought for you here is that if this were all about true populism, we would not be debating defunding Planned Parenthood, and we would not be debating restricting reproductive rights in the US or globally. Um, in fact, we'd be doing the opposite. So um, I wanna talk about sort of two <coughs> examples of that, one in the domestic context, uh, Planned Parenthood fight, and then one in the global context to sort of play that out. Um, in the U.S. context, though, um, just to, to state the obvious here, defunding Planned Parenthood is highly unpopular. Um, it's a terrible idea. Um, and recent polling uh, really backs that up. Um, the Kaiser Family Foundation just came out with a poll uh, about two weeks ago, I think, that found 75% of Americans uh, support federal funding for Planned Parenthood. And as I always like to point out, this isn't like a, an issue people haven't heard of. Like this is, people have heard of it, they've thought about it, and they, they have concluded they support federal funding for Planned Parenthood. Um, and that figure includes 57% of Republican women. So this is also spreading um, across partisan lines. Um, and, that's, and that's just one of many polls like that. 
um, this is a pretty steady figure that, if anything, we've seen um, increased support over the years. Um, so, um, so defunding Planned Parenthood, which was a provision of the uh, health care repeal, is not a popular idea, and it's not pop it's not reflective of a populist mission project. Um, and I think it's also important to note what we mean by defunding Planned Parenthood just to problematize it further because it's a little bit of a misnomer when we talk about defunding Planned Parenthood. Um, there's no line item in the federal budget for Planned Parenthood. Um, there's nothing that they can just strike out and say, take that out. And, um, the proposal which was included in the failed uh, health care repeal bill would have excluded Planned Parenthood from participating in the Medicaid program. It would have uh, blocked Planned Parenthood health centers from receiving reimbursements for delivery of health care to Medicaid patients. Um, and this is the height of irony when you think back to the, um, the conservative populist movement that we saw bubble up in, in 2009 in the original Affordable Care Act debates and, and since, um, where we've heard so many times from opponents of the Affordable Care Act that the government should not tell Americans which doctors they can go to. Um, which it, it doesn't actually, um, but defunding Planned Parenthood would do that. Um, so this is not because of populism. This is because of a far-right political agenda that's exploiting broader voter anger to push a very unpopular agenda. Um, and I think the reason I come with a little bit of optimism is I think we really saw some accountability on that over the last several months. Um, and when you talk about a patient movement, I think one of the pieces that's been so inspiring um, sitting at Planned Parenthood has been seeing our patients tell their stories. And actually on Friday, I was just in the office of one uh, member of Congress, a district office, who had, had been undecided about the vote um, as patients told their stories. Uh, patients who were um, uh, constituents told their story one after another, some extremely personal and humbling, really putting it on the line. So. Um, so I think there is a patient movement underfoot. Um, so my second sort of example is looking globally how um, not only are we not seeing a populist, a true populist project underway, we're actually seeing the effort to combat them. Um, and that is uh, to talk about the global gag rule. Um, and this was one of the first things the president did in taking office. Um, has, who, who here knows about the global gag rule? Ah, you guys are an above average. <laughs> I'm not surprised, but um, very good. Um, uh, so the global gag, I'm going to define it anyway because it always needs to be defined because it, it's one of the most misdefined policies. Uh, it's a, also known as the Mexico City policy. It's a policy that prohibits organizations from receiving foreign assistance if they use any bit of their own money to provide any services, information, education, referrals about abortion, to basically to talk about abortion, um, or to advocate for the legalization of abortion in their own country. So if they use any of their own resources to essentially participate in the democratic process of their own country. Um, and this administration went even further. This is a policy that's been ping-ponging back and forth since Reagan. Uh, President Obama rescinded it um, in his first week in office. So we weren't surprised to see it come back in the first week. Um, what was noteworthy was the expansion of it. Um, this president went uh, so far as to expand it to all of global health, where it, is, it had been previously applying strictly to the family planning program globally. Um, so that represented essentially a 15-fold increase on the policy. Um, and what's really noteworthy about it this time as well is that he signed the gag rule um, just two days after the historic women's marches around the world. Um, and it impact, it's a policy, it doesn't only impact women, but it impacts women the most. So here we were, I was in DC, um, at a historic level of turnout, um, all around the country, historic levels of turnout in every state, and then all around the world, historic levels of turnout. Um, four, over four million people standing up, and a common refrain was, we will not be silenced. Yet silencing women is exactly what the global gag rule is trying to do. Um, and they're doing it on our behalf as Americans. They're representing the American people as they do it. So you know what? Don't take away their rights in my name. Um, so I, I think in the terms of this conversation, it's important to talk about the cost of this policy. And I'm sure we'll talk more about it throughout this panel. Um, but it is going to be felt in public health terms. 
um, it's going to be felt in the public health of communities around the world. Um, and not again, not just women. Um, in the past, the primary impact of the global gag rule has been loss of access to contraception because primarily it's cut off uh, the most qualified providers of family planning programs. Um, and that has in turn led to increased rates of unintended pregnancy, unsafe abortion, and in, in many cases, increased maternal mortality. Um, now that we've seen the policy expanded, we're gonna, we expect these impacts to be exacerbated that much greater, but also limiting access to HIV services, to Zika prevention and, and uh, treatment efforts, maternal and child health programs, <clears throat> and so much more. So it's really um, staggering and humbling when you think of the scope that we're, we're anticipating. Um, and I think that we'll, we've seen a lot of efforts at the global level to start to stand up against it, but I, I, I don't think that we can assume we can stand up against all of it and replace what is going to be lost. Um, and the gag rule is only one piece. I think we're, we've already seen a budget proposal that is going to do enormous damage around the world, um, and we're anticipating um, attacks on UNFPA, the, the UN Population Agency, which is the most vital source of contraceptive supplies around the world. Um, so we're uh, seeing a lot of threats to human rights um, at all these levels. And while they're not popular, I think it is really important to talk about, and building on what you said, that popularity should not be the arbiter of human rights. So while we do, we do have a patient movement, we do have, I think the idea of access to healthcare is popular in its intrinsic form, that also should be the arbiter of, of these rights for us. Um, so because I'm an advocate, I'll just quickly end on a call to action, <laughs> um, which is sexual and reproductive health and rights are human rights under threat in the US and around the world, and it's not because of populism. Um, and so this is a time for action, and I, you know, stepping back, looking at last Friday, I, you know, the takeaway for us is our voices mattered. It did matter, and everything we have done has mattered, and we have to keep doing it, and we have to do it in lock arms with, um, you know, peers around the world, and I think one of the things that does give me some optimism is a rise of a global movement um, for our health and rights. So I'll pause there. Thank you. Um, now I'm going to go a little bit. I'm going to. I was going to go in alphabetical order, <laughs> but I'm going to change things up a little because I think last focus is follows nicely on that. So I'm sorry. <laughs> Great, so good evening everyone. Um, my name is Na Hammond and I'm a program officer with the Groundswell Fund. And for folks who are not familiar with the Groundswell Fund, we are the largest national funder of the US reproductive justice movement. Um, and we make grants and provide capacity building support to grassroots organizations that are led by women of color, low income women, and trans people. So I'm actually really excited to join this conversation today because I actually do feel hopeful. Um, and hopefully I can bring some of that into the conversation today. Um, I am really excited that we're going to have a conversation about what it's going to take to defend healthcare as a human right for all people, particularly people who are facing the highest um, health disparities based on race, class, gender, sexuality, and immigration status. So these past few months have been very heavy for many communities, but they've also made uh, it really clear that we are in a historic moment. How many people here have attended a march or a rally or know someone who's done that? Right. So for folks on video, the entire room almost raised their hands. Um, so from women's marches to no ban, no walls, no raids, actions, we are seeing millions of people take to the street and diverse communities come together to resist. This is actually representing one of the biggest base building opportunities that has ever presented itself to progressive movements. And really we have the opportunity to think about what it's going to take to engage people long term beyond just coming to an action in issue based work moving forward. And I'm excited to talk about what does this mean for philanthropy. I'm going to assume that people here maybe work in philanthropy too. <laughs> Um, and I think it's really important for us to realize that as much as we're in a political moment, we are also in a philanthropic moment. I think like many funders in this room, you've probably been in many conversations with other funders, having really serious conversations over the past few months. 
I've been in conversations where people have been asking, do we continue with business as usual? Or what do we need to rethink about what we've been doing so that we can be relevant and responsive to the grantees and the movements that we care about? So as we're seeing rising right-wing um, populism in the United States and growing attacks on the most vulnerable communities, including threats to public health through the shrinking of um, the efforts to shrink Medicaid, um, gutting the EPA and affordable housing, we as a sector really need to think carefully about what we do now, because what we do is going to have lasting impact beyond the next four years, but really for decades. And thankfully, there's actually a lot that we can learn from intersectional movements, like the reproductive justice movement, that center a human rights framework and approach. So, um, if you will indulge me, I, will, I want to just share um, three lessons um, from social justice movements for this moment for funders. Um, and I'll name them now, and if we don't get to all of them, I can talk a little bit more about them. So the first is to fund organizing. Um, the second one is to fund across issues and movements. And the third one is to fund work that challenges white supremacy. So I'll go into them a little bit now. <laughs> I think it's really important in this moment for us to be thinking about funding grassroots organizing for progressive change. As Frederick Douglass um, said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. So with Republican control of the House, the Senate, and the executive branch, this demand right now needs to come from the people. And grassroots organizing is one way to harness that power of the people. And it really, for anyone who's not familiar with grassroots organizing, it's just when ordinary people come together to gain skills and use our collective power to transform systems and conditions that shape our lives. In this country, we really haven't been able to win any large-scale social change without people exerting their people power. Whether it's women protesting and marching for the right to vote, or working people and labor unions winning us um, the right to have a weekend and labor protections, or more recent examples of the, how the movement for black lives has really elevated a conversation about police violence and anti-black racism in the United States. Power concedes nothing without a demand. Even in uh, the gleeful um, uh, defeat of the American Health Care Act, um, recently, what we saw was um, this was an issue that a lot of reproductive justice organizations that Groundswell supports took on and really mobilized their constituents to get involved, to attend a town hall, to call their elected officials. And what we saw was hundreds of thousands of people in blue and purple and red states um, calling and demanding and showing up at town halls. And the result was that Democrats and moderate Republicans um, ultimately um, um, ultimately um, were able to help this bill um, make sure that it did not get a vote. And we cannot underestimate in this moment the importance of organizing. The second thing that I was sharing is uh, the imperative right now to fund across issues and movements. So the kind of mass-based organizing that can bring enough people together to actually have the power to make any social change and actually reach hearts and minds of people who may not be um, well-versed in an issue um, is the kind of organizing that cannot afford to be single issue focused. And moreover, um, at Groundswell, we believe that it doesn't exist in one single sector. So for Groundswell, we've been thinking about, um, as a funder that cares about reproductive justice, that we are not going to be able to defend reproductive justice in the current climate by just funding organizations that focus on reproductive justice. Communities that we fund are in the fight of their lifetime, and the only thing that will really change that outcome is grassroots organizing that works, that reaches across issues, and that stands in solidarity with other movements. So that means that when there are attacks on immigrants, on Muslims, on working people, on women, on LGBT people, that nobody is standing alone. And we as funders can create the conditions to ensure that organizations can actually stand up with each other. Um, and lastly, I'll just share around funding work that directly challenges white supremacy. So after the election, um, we heard a lot of efforts to explain what happened. 
and why there was a right-wing backlash. Um, many people blamed the economy, which is a convenient um, scapegoat, except for the inconvenient fact that Black, Latino, and Native American people, three of the groups that are hardest hit by the economic situation, all voted against Trump. A lot of people blamed gender oppression and sexism, but this doesn't explain why 52% of white women voted for Trump, and while the majority of women of color and men of color uh, voted for his opponent. At some point, we need to talk about the centrality of race and specifically white supremacy and the role that it played in this election and how white supremacy is operating under the current administration's executive orders, appointees, and decisions. And we cannot afford to ignore white supremacy anymore. But we can't dismantle white supremacy if the majority of organizations that we are funding are white-led. Organizations that have little track record of standing in solidarity with communities of color, organizations that lack a racial justice analysis, and that are afraid to talk about white supremacy or race. For funders, this means that we may need to take a good look at our knee-jerk reactions. It can be tempting as progressive funders to move resources away from grassroots organizations to double down on big national organizations that are often white-led. These organizations offer the allure of scale and impact. And while I'm not suggesting that we um, not fund national organizations, they have a very important role to play in our movements, we also have to redefine what we mean by scale and impact in this time. And, and I mean here, um, in this current climate, because of um, the way things are at the federal level, um, change, progressive change is going to be harder in the coming years. But there are opportunities at the local and state level to move progressive change. And it is important to support organizations that have been organizing in these contexts for a very long time. Um, for Groundswell, we've seen a lot of, of these organizations are led by people of color, specifically for us, women of color and transgender people. Um, and um, nothing is, okay, so national organizations play a critical role in the moment, but they really can't reach um, some of the communities that these local organizations can play. So for, for us, we really feel that organizations that are best poised to bring together diverse movements to organize and ensure wins that we can see in the next few years are the ones that are already working at the intersection and that are already being led by those who are most I'm not keeping everyone to time limits because things are interesting. So I'll, I'll make sure everyone gets to uh, to ask questions and all. This mic isn't working. Okay, I guess I have to be like yeah, in my mouth, right? Um, anyway, um, Greg, can you pick up from there, please? Yes, and, and I think I'm going to reflect a lot of what you just said. So okay, three points I want to make. One is. Um, I think we misrecognize the current moment as sort of a populist moment. I think we have to think about the, the continuity of what, what has occurred. And that for 30 years, as Tony Jeff, the, the late historian said, we've made a cult of material self-interest. Who is here is above 50 years old. You know, if you remember Reagan and Thatcher, the idea that meat is good, um, and that this, the, the attacks on the welfare state began 30 years ago when I was graduating in high school. And so the idea that we're, 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 we're seeing a, a, a new assault on the sort of structures that tie us together as brothers and sisters it, it is absolutely false. Um, and the idea that um, we've been making sort of uh, inexorable progress for the past 30 years is also another myth that we have to sort of disabuse ourselves of. If you look at this, the structures of inequality that have sort of risen through both Democratic and Republican administrations, you, you know that to be true. Um, it's interesting. I had dinner with somebody who um, many people in this room know, Deborah Peterson Small, who used to be the policy director of Drug Policy Alliance. And we had a small dinner and we were talking, and I was saying, you know, Deborah, I feel like I'm in the middle of an ocean. I don't know what to do. I'm just, I'm just terrified about what's happening, and I'm just rowing, and I don't know where the shore is. And she looked at me and she said, Don't you, don't you have any clue about that's, that's the sort of 
path that I've been uh, I've been treading for the past 50, 60 years, and that the struggle has never been uh, over or, or anywhere near completion for, for communities of color. And, you know, if we think everything was different before Trump was elected, think about Ferguson and, and, and the, the, the police violence we saw over the past two years on our national TV. So let's, let's not make this the populist moment that Trump represents. Let's take it as a sort of a capitulation of uh, progressive ideals, which basically started with Reagan and Thatcher uh, and legislative bill plan and welfare reforms. Did you remember that? Mm -hmm. Glass Steagall. I mean, all of the what we what we what was wrought in November was the culmination of 30 years of work, right? Um, the other thing is, um, for all this talk about populism and left populism and progressive ideals, we uh, we love we love to be technocrats, right? We for all our smacking down Donald Trump as sort of a know nothing president and. They don't know, any, know anything about health and the environment. Um, we put perhaps too much faith in it. And this leads me to the conversation about investing in people. Um, we had, we, I teach a class up in uh, New Haven, and we personally done various projects, from drug pricing to Zika and reproductive rights, um, to maternal health among African American women in Georgia. And we had a young man named Julio Lopez from Make the Road, Connecticut, come and talk to our students today. And he said to a bunch of Yale students, the first thing I want to teach you is that you don't know shit, right? <laughs> so if you're going to work with communities, you're going to have to give up the culture of expertise that you, you were trained, you're all highly trained professionals that know better than the, the person on the ground or what's needed. And if we're going to do that, it means we organize and philanthropy, right? I, I know OSF well. Kasha Malmanas December came to me in 2000 and said, oh, all the stuff you did with ACT UP and TAG, come do it in Eastern Europe and, you know, and, and, unmoored sort of the, the, the work we did from our home in New York and, and sort of exported around the world. It's time to come home, okay? It's time to come home, and it means that OSF's work on health, which is largely international, needs to come home. I work on health, right? What am I thinking about right now? About emergency room visits in Detroit, Michigan, post-executive order. I don't know what I don't know what the answer is going to be, but I'm I'm curious to know if if Arab American and Muslim Americans are having deleterious health outcomes based on the stigma and discrimination associated with the executive order and all the pronouncements that we've just um, Immigration health. We know from immigration rates way before Trump that when immigration enforcement actions rise, healthcare visits go down. Well, baby visits, uh, dialysis, anything you can think of, right? Um, substance use. You know, I was talking to people in, who some of the, in the audience said, we want to do a lead program in New Haven. You know, who knows if it's going to be good or bad? But guess what? They're planning to get a DOJ grant so we could pilot a lead program in New Haven. Guess what? New Haven's a sanctuary city. Um, so we are now ineligible for any of these DOJ grants. Um, so I, I've been trying to figure out how to um, make sense of what's happened over the past few months. And part of it is everything old is new again. And it's interesting, you know, we're having a civil disobedience training in New Haven in a couple of weeks, and who are the people who are coming to do it? It's friends from ACT UP, DC Craig and Lex, and the big rise in resistance, some of the groups that have appeared in New York for the past few, few months. It's a bunch of old ACT UP people and some new ones. But the point is, is that we need to go back to our roots in community organizing and civil disobedience and civil resistance. and and. Stop being the experts, yeah. investing in sort of more policy papers and more think tanks and more workshops. And for philanthropists, I think it's very difficult to say you're going to give money to Lake Road, Connecticut, right? They're working in Bridgeport with undocumented immigrants. Um, and this is a long term commitment they're making. You're not going to get, you know, uh, uh, a deliverable at the end of six months or at the end of three, at the end of a year. You're going to make a long term commitment to communities across the country. Um, and so that's where I, that's where sort of the past few months have led me is that think of this as a continuous sort of wave of structural violence that's been going on for three years against many different communities, LGBT communities, communities of color women. Um, two is stop investing in a culture of expertise, de from working with communities. 
expertise has a role in, in, in contact and being informed by what, what communities see happening around them, but it does, does no good as sort of an abstract theoretical uh, uh, notion. And coming from university, it's hard to say. <laughs> People don't want to hear that. Um, and the other thing is you, you're going to have to, sh I mean, it's going to be a culture shift for people at OSF and other philanthropies to sort of say, um, we're going to have to do things differently and, and, and take some of the work we've pioneered around the world in open societies and helping marginalized populations and bring it home. Um, you know, so that's where I'd be. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, uh, um, Hi, how are you? First thing I want to do is I want to thank um, OSF for putting together such a wonderful event. Um, I'm a little bit more on the informal side, so bear with me. So at some point in time when you want to ask questions later on, if you want to like just redirect something and like just channel it a little bit more directly at me, I would, that would be fine. I'm going to start by saying that like any form of traveling to a different location, and I just came to New York City just recently, I have to tell you, my timeline was just a little bit behind, so I don't think I realized at this one particular moment that I was actually sitting in New York City. And it didn't hit me until Elizabeth mentioned about North Carolina being one of those many states that hasn't passed Medicaid expansion. And then it just became totally aware to me that I'm in a place right now where you may not recognize the situation that we're actually enduring in the, the regional south at this particular point in time. So, I'm going to, as a tribute to Broadway live shows, I'm going to go totally off script. So, that's why I may need refocusing. I'm basically just gonna now just say things that are more so just off the cuff of my head. First thing I'd like to start is, my background was read a little bit earlier. I'm a retired detective sergeant from New York City Police Department. Uh, my last few years I worked primarily with um, organized crime control unit bureaus and doing narcotic operations. Why I bring this up? Simply because I'm doing advocacy right now that revolves solely around harm reduction models and techniques and basically around um, overdose prevention, uh, the opioid crisis that we're looking at. Um, as far as talking about populist components, I'm not going to do it because I exist in a red state. So my state had a multitude of counties. That is one of the contributing reasons as to why the administration that we have right now exists. So the populist, populist movement actually exists very, very strongly in North Carolina. But I'm going to make the counter argument and I'm just show you why as to how things can change. Because we do do effective advocacy in North Carolina, in a red state, and I think it's significantly important. The organization I work with is called North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition. It is a grassroots advocacy, um, services development, project development, coalition building um, unit that basically addresses people that are vulnerable to um, drug use, sex workers, um, 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 gender discrimination, um, people in the LGBTQ community. So basically we're heavily involved. The most important thing that you need to know about harm reduction is the fact that we are attempting to improve health, promote health um, through a very, very dignified means by meeting people where they're at. In other words, we don't ask people to basically say, well, at any particular point in time, if you're doing something that's more so illegal or something that's a risk behavior, we want to mitigate the risk. We want to lower the negative consequences by saying, well, we're not expecting you to stop doing what you're doing, but what can we do as a means of basically just minimizing those risk factors, which may include things like condom distribution or um, establishing syringe exchange programs and the like, which is what I want to get to. North Carolina, over the last three years, what we've done is, is we've actually enacted three major, major, major laws. One of them is something which is called a decriminalization of, or partial de, um, decriminalization of syringes, which basically means that if you're in possession of a syringe, um, you won't be prosecuted for that particular offense if you let the officer know that you have this. We've been involved with basically implementation, passing of laws for the 911 Good Samaritan laws, which basically means that if there is an overdose victim, which once again is a public health issue, if there's an overdose victim, basically the caller that's making that call to say that life won't be prosecuted for that particular offense. Neither will the victim of that particular overdose be prosecuted. We've implemented naloxone, or the passing a law when naloxone will be used by first responders, and primarily what we actually stressed and emphasized was the use of naloxone and Narcan by law enforcement personnel. For those of you that don't know what naloxone is, basically it's an opioid antagonist that basically reverses the effect of an overdose. Mm -hmm. In other words, another number one symptom of an overdose is basically respiratory despair, 
naloxone is basically going to return the ability to breathe for that particular individual. And then most recently in this past year, what we, the law that we passed was syringe exchange. Now, I'm rattling this off because I kind of want you to feel this stew at the same time. Little carrots, little beef, little potatoes. <laughs> and I want you to understand that I'm saying that this is taking place in this red state. All right, so the question is, is once again, we we'll get to this populist conversation and say, well, this is the population of people, and if the, if the, the, the motives and the objectives are about the people, and the people voted for an administration that says, we're about the people, well, then how is it that we're moving through with these conversations and getting through? Now, I have a phenomenal executive director. His name is Robert Childs. Just, just quote a shout out. And you know, so, <laughs> a little joke. Um, he'll appreciate that. Um, and he does a phenomenal job of actually just redirecting purpose and direction as far as where we're going, as far as this opioid crisis and where it actually stands. Now, what's significant about the South, which is entirely different from being in New York, is, is the southern region currently right now represents the epicenter of the HIV AIDS virus. Nine of the top ten states in the country are in the southern region states. Coincidentally, if you just follow just read any particular data trail, you will also see that most of those states do not have Medicaid expansion. So once again, we have a problem, and we're not taking care of the problem. Now, what harm reduction does is it doesn't immediately eliminate the problem, but it starts to promote health issues, and it starts to create dialogues with people within those communities with those vulnerabilities and problems where these issues can now be addressed a little bit, a little bit better. Now, the significant thing here, and I think this is the tricky thing, if someone was to ask me why, how do you do this? So I'm gonna avoid that question for later on. So I'm saving it'll take more time to save time. Okay, so in <laughs> okay. But I'm gonna give it on the short. What we've done is, is we've absolutely recognized the importance of how we create advocacy strategies. And one of the most important things, and I'm hopefully not going to offend anyone in the room, and I do have to say this before, I want to preface it by saying that the objective, the result that you get sometimes, could be more important than the means in which you go after that particular result, okay? So what we've done is, is we've created very, very, very conservative partnerships, very, very, very Republican partnerships. Now once again, we're looking at the administration that we have, and these are technically the people that we're partnering with, all right? So when we promote advocacy opportunities, we're going to use a language, our, our values, where we may say, say things like pro-law enforcement, or pro-life, or cost savings, things that are much more along the lines of like more conservative way of thinking. You know, it's important when you do lobbying legislative efforts that your whoever's sponsoring your bill matters. The person that's sponsoring your bill is very important. Our sponsors, our champions have been very, very Republican conservative sponsors. Now, I'm going to stop there to say the question there would be, well, why? And this is where, and I know we're going to talk a little bit more on it, but this is where the conversation of where a lot of what we're talking about right now is going to be handled whether we choose to handle it or we don't, because the opioid crisis in our country right now is very, very real. The problem that we have right now is real, so there are going to be decisions that are ultimately going to be made whether we choose to actually cognitively make it on legislative lines or community lines or whatever, they're going to have to be done. I can tell you a conversation I had earlier today out of the Senate office of West Virginia in Washington, D.C., where basically it is acknowledged in their office that something happened on Friday. They also acknowledge that if there were a second, if there was a second round of what happened on Friday, everything pertaining to the conservative side of the Republican Party and and the Freedom Caucus and the like would be a dismissed dismiss point of view. The only thing that's going to be significant moving forward is what the constituents need. So when I heard that earlier, I said, well, uh, there's something to that. But then again, later this afternoon, some of you probably know, in the state of Kansas, Medicaid expansion was just passed. Now, it's more than likely probably going to be vetoed by the governor. But I think what we're seeing is we're starting to see a move where people are basically saying right now, you know, what is in our best interest? What exactly do we need? How exactly do we need to take care of ourselves? Is it a good thing if hospitals are closing down? All right? We have an opioid crisis where people are falling out in the street and dying. Dying. So why are we doing these things that are basically working as an opposition to 
the main objective, which is basically making people better, keeping people safe. Furthermore, the biggest thing that we do, and I've heard two comments about law enforcement, you know, whenever I hear commentary on Black Lives Matter, it just requires me needing a lot more time because it probably requires a lot more conversation so that there's a, a mutual balance that can be found somewhere. You know, there's merit in the argument on both sides, but one of the conservative things that we do, or the Republican things we do, it actually is a means of getting this legislation passed for these harm reductive, harm reductive measures that I mentioned is, is we ally with law enforcement. We basically take a public health argument of basically what is it like not only to remove a syringe off of someone and make them safer because they're not using the drug, but the argument becomes, well, what happens if you're stuck by that syringe? And how exactly do we address this? So I can tell you that working with conversations with individuals in the LGBT community, actually it's just a specific trans group earlier today, and also just legislative means with problems that they're having in Indiana, where the argument becomes where, if at some particular point in time, legislatively, someone says, well, we don't particularly agree with what you're saying, we don't want to do it, we don't want to listen to these changes you want, we don't want syringe exchange programs, we don't care about public health. Well, the question is, the administration said that it does want to support law enforcement. So let's change the argument, let's change the discussion, let's change the dialogue, and say, forget about the public health end of this. Let's view it from the public safety end. Basically, if you implement the syringe exchange programs, your needle sticks will go down by 66%. Is that something you would be interested in? So there's various ways of actually, even in these red states, even in populist environments, basically present arguments and discussions that are ultimately going to lead to getting you to where you want to go. I'm just going to finally close, only because I did hear it before. It's about a lead program. That's a travesty, that basically, that, you know, because of the DJ Department of Justice money that you can't move forward with the LEAD program. Just to be specific on what a LEAD program is, the LEAD program is, it stands for Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Programs. It's a pre-booking program that, in essence, rather than arresting someone on a low level, like let's say narcotic offense or, or sex work offense, basically what they've done is they're redirected. They're redirected to a program where there is an intake process. The intake process will subsequently lead to some type of case work help. In the case work help may include anything from food to residential placement to drug rehab to <coughs> job placement, whatever it is that brought them into the, in, in, put them in the direction of the police, the program is designed basically to just basically circumvent that. So we're not filling up our justice systems with the rest. In this particular instance, that was a perfect example where the government side identified a safe zone location, monies can't go there, the lead program won't be in. LEAD is moving rapidly through our country. We implemented the first one, my organization, North Carolina Harm Reduction, placed the first one in the state of North Carolina, which is the fourth in the country in Fayetteville, North Carolina Police Department. Currently, right now, we're looking at Statesville PD, we're looking at in Hanover County, which is uh, Wilmington PD. So it's moving. The city of Philadelphia has adapted it, the city of Atlanta has adapted it, LA is looking at it, it's moving. These are changes that are taking place in the country. So before we go total doom and gloom as far as the overall direction of where public health is going and the moves that we're going to make and where this administration is going to take us, some of the directions, especially since they failed in their first attempt, some of the directions that they want to take us in, they're not going to be simply able to go because now the fight is a little bit easier because they've lost in the first battle. Right. So. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm, now I'm going to kind of start some discussion here and I'm going to throw it open to questions. But um, my, my big question to everyone, you know, I spent a bunch of years writing a series on health care costs, then writing a book, and I heard from dozens, thousands of people on the ground who were unhappy, sometimes with public health, sometimes with their private health, and their big question was, especially given all we're talking about, the get, every, get the people on the ground involved, was what can I do? You know, what can I do? How can I get involved? Um, one thing that really blew me away about the Women's March was to see the diversity of groups that came together to, to see common ground. And one thing I don't see in healthcare is that kind of unifying force. So my first challenge, and one thing after I wrote this book, and this will be my next crusade probably, um, is uh, to, to start an online group called like We the Patients, to let people get involved, whether their disease is, uh, you know, whether they have mental health 
health issues, whether, and because I think one of the reasons, look, there are, what, four big insurers in this country and hundreds of disease groups, each of which works for their own, uh, their, and, and there's been a kind of divide and conquer philosophy that I think the pharmaceutical world has used very well. You know, they ally with disease groups mm -hmm. from their drug, and, and instead of people seeing themselves as having a common common issue, they see themselves as um, if you give money to my drug, you're not, you know, uh, it's, or if you, if you give money to their drug, it's not gonna go wrong. So I think my challenge to everyone on the panel is like, how do you get people involved? How do you, you know, I can start my website, but um, you know, it has been a kind of top-down approach to help you. And I think about, about the Clinton Health Plan, the ACA, you know, I, you hear it debated in Washington in these theoretical terms, then you see how it plays out on the ground, and there's a pretty big divide there. Any papers? So we're working on drug pricing in our clinic, and we've been working with groups in Maryland and Connecticut. Um, first of all, how do you get people involved? Go back to community organizing. There's just no other way around it. It just you, you don't get people involved by funding big national NGOs or big state NGOs. You're gonna to have to get down to the grassroots. That being said, on drug pricing, it's very hard because guess who funds most of the patient groups in the United States? The New England Journal and JAMA both have had articles where 80 percent of patient groups are funded by the drug companies. Um, Maryland just passed the price gouging bill that, that, uh, um, last week. Um, the Connecticut bills went down in flames, and all of a sudden the language in the bills were kind of vaguely like somebody talked to a former rep. Um, no, seriously. Yeah, no, I'm sure it's and, and, not, and so, and, and, and you know, I'm not talking out of school, but you know, the, the major lobbying group is like, you know, it's a little bit itchy about the idea of like organizing patients. I'm like, what's the, what? What's the downside of like of bringing people in to sort of talk about these issues from from very um, personal perspectives? And I think there's a, there's a reticence among people to do that sort of on the ground work, which you've heard North Carolina and other places have been very successful. So I think um, gotta let go and give in to the idea that we need to do community organizing on all our issues across the issues. We're going to make any sense. Um, I'll just briefly share that um, in talking to our grantees after the election about um, what their main priorities were, a number of our grantees were really focused on the Affordable Care Act and defending it, um, particularly talking to their bases and constituencies um, in local and um, state contexts to really get them active. Um, so for example, Raising Women's Voices is uh, partnering with um, over 30 regional coordinator organizations that have connections to local um, communities and that actually are engaging people who are patients and we're just people in the community to actually stand up and think about healthcare and actually take action. So I would agree with you that it really is about supporting com um, community organizing that's led by people at the grassroots who can really reach communities um, that the national organizations sometimes can't. I'll just, uh, I mean, I agree with that completely and I think one of the reasons that we've had um, the, you know, the surgeons and, and people speaking out in the Planned Parenthood battle specifically is people know, people have been to Planned Parenthood. They know what, it to, what they're talking about. And I think so much of healthcare debate can get so abstracted and, and uh, distinct from people's lived experiences. Um, and, I, and I think it's actually, again, to get to this uh, discordance between sort of popular experience versus um, the policymakers pushing an agenda you know, I, I do think I've I've been a Planned Parenthood for almost seven years now. I've been through many every you know many a fight, and um, and each time I think I'm struck by the sense that those sort of pushing an agenda that would um, cut out women's health care from whatever you know equation you're talking about um, seem surprised by the reaction. And I think it's that they those are the same people who have not probably been to a Planned Parenthood and received health care. But we know that millions and millions and millions of people across the country viscerally know that experience. And I guess to me that's what's missing in other aspects of the healthcare conversation is how do you make, how do you connect the dots when you're talking about programs that are named different things at different levels and so on. And so to take it to a very meta level, I, I do think, you know, there's a there's a core democratic process aspect of this. And, 
you know, Greg, as you were talking, I was struggling a little bit as you said, you know, the technocrat piece. I'm like, no, the facts matter, and we need expertise, and um, uh, and you know, defend the law. <laughs> um, but I think, I mean, and I think you 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 said it well by, it, you know, tech, technocrats absent community input is where we really see that it fall apart. And I think, you know, at a meta level, we're really we are in an era where you know the idea that you, you don't have pure fact is that, 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 that no fact can really be true. It makes a conversation about healthcare very very difficult. But this is why I, I I really think we need to get to patient experience because people may not know that the ACA is different than Obamacare, but they know what happened when you know their daughter had an unplanned pregnancy and couldn't find a provider to, to, I mean, people know their own experience, whether they're well-educated or not. And what struck me is, hey, I'm writing for the New York Times with my series, and it was mostly, you know, well-educated, well-insured, but the comments came from all these people who just knew it was someplace they could tell their story, and it was outside the firewall, so, you know, they could just comment and leave stories, and it was really wrenching. Um, and, and you know, I felt like, they felt like people weren't, in Washington, weren't listening to what their experience was, and all of this complicated stuff, you know, with the navigators and ductiles, and they, they just, it was, you know, their issues were so much more kind of on the brown bread and butter, so, um, yeah, John. Yeah, thanks, and I, I agree with, so much of what's been said, and I, I hope it doesn't sound pedantic to say that we need a popular movement for the right to health in this country, but not a populist movement for the right to health. And let me explain what I mean by that. I think, I think Nat answered the question of what that movement needs to look like. It needs to be built on the foundations of community organizing. It needs to be built on patient stories. It needs to be intersectional. It needs to be connected to racial justice. But I do think it needs to reject many of the features of this right-wing populism, whether it's new or not, that we see. I think it needs to, as Chloe's saying, work through the democratic process. I think there is a role for technocrats, as much as I totally agree that we have overly romanticized evidence and it doesn't persuade people. I was thrilled when the Congressional Budget Office pointed out what, you know, long live the technocrat. You know, we need them, they're part of our democracy. And I say this because we have seen examples of dictators um, advancing the right to health. And that's not what we want. I mean, the, the architect of the famous 30 baht scheme in Thailand was the same architect of the spate of extrajudicial killings against people who use drugs, and was basically the Berlusconi of Asia. That is not what we want. We want the right to help in a democratic way. And Jonathan, can I um, challenge your dark view? <laughs> <laughs> um, because I, I, I guess what I'm always thinking about, you know, I feel like in a weird way you let the Tea Party and what became of them hijack the term populism and sure. turn it into a dirty word. Do you see um, an analogous but left-wing progressive version of the Tea Party? But do you see potential for that emerging at this moment in time? Sure, and by the way, I. I'm loving the allegation of being dark. I've never been called that. Um, that's it's so great for my cred. It's so I'm loving it. Um, but I think I mean, I think you saw it with Bernie Sanders. Uh, absolutely. I'm, I'm still not sure. Um, and yeah, I think we can agree. I mean, um, Trump, Brexit, Le Pen, Orban, I mean, they're, they're giving populism a, a really bad name. But I also think that at the end of the day, populism is not a coherent ideology. It's a stance. It's sort of 
what you package your ideology in, and it can be dangerous on both ends of the spectrum. Well, and I would just say, I do think that, I would call those more white nationalism than, than populism, and that's where I, I do just want to, you know, I think how we're advocating this moment has as much to do with, and I think we all reflect at this point, how we fight back on the attacks we're seeing in the short term as it does in laying out the vision of the world we see and want to see. And I do think, especially in the conversation of health where it couldn't be more true, um, we should reject a nationalist framework and really see ourselves as globally connected are, um, and I think health issues present um, such a perfect example of how we are globally connected, um, but certainly are not the only way. And how about nationally connected? I mean, this is a pretty um, divided country. Um, we tend to view health care as kind of a silo from education and child care and nutrition. Um, you know, I, there's a, uh, um, a wonderful book called the, uh, it's called the American Healthcare Paradox, about how uh, if you look at our overall health spending, uh, that our overall health spending could be less if we viewed it as a kind of, uh, all of these things uh, feed into health. I think that's a bad uh, word to use because I was about to say we're working on the implications of a story about the implications of hunger in older Americans. It's a big issue that feeds into health, but we in this country see that as, you know, that's a different thing. Well, I, I would just say I've been in, every year I watch a series of debates in the appropriations committees in Congress where I hear member after me member defend or cuts to family planning programs by saying they're supporting maternal health programs. So, I mean, yes, so there's a disconnect. <laughs> um, what, uh, and Jonathan, maybe, um, and maybe uh, working in North Carolina too, maybe you have problems of insight into this. Why do people vote against their self-interest? <laughs> <laughs> That could be a very long answer. <laughs> but, and I sometimes I hate to do it, but there's an elephant in every single room, in the corner of the room. And it's just a matter of what audience I'm around or how comfortable you're going to be with the answer or whatever's going to be. But the answer is the answer. Um, the dynamic of certain counties that I can travel to in North Carolina or in the South where there are, are multiple Confederate flags, large flags flying in the back of trucks. Uh, the dynamic of small towns that I can enter into where basically just through, once again, every I, I explained what my past was, so I can, I can sense people, I can feel people. I know what people are telling me without their using their words. Um, it's clear, it's clear. And to be very honest and just to make it not so much of a political conversation, but just from my vantage point, since it was directed at me, just really just keeping it kind of real. You know, it was eight years, eight years of a black man in the office of the presidency of the United States. And basically this was the first opportunity of total empowerment and just revitalization that our nation could have with people that felt just suppressed and oppressed by the fact that an African American was holding that particular office, has an opportunity to speak now, has an opportunity to say something. So at this point, any sensibility, any sense of rationale, any logical thinking goes totally, totally out the door. If someone tells me tomorrow that the two kids that I have and my particular double wide trailer is not gonna have medical care, and I'm now gonna vote for someone who's basically saying, yeah, we're gonna take it away from you, does it make sense? Absolutely not, absolutely not. But I'm saying whatever feeling, whatever, we're just coming to a true realization of whatever innate feelings of discomfort and fear that we're ultimately going to have to face. There's not no statistical numbers that aren't reflecting basically where Latino American numbers are going to be, Hispanic American numbers are going to be over the next 20, 30 years. There are fear factors that play in our United States of America and the way they're implemented everywhere. You know, so if I had to say why, I mean, that's probably the weakest answer, but I can't 
dismissive from what I truly feel. And do you feel if they knew? I, I know you got something. I know you, I know you got something to add. Really. I want to add one, one little thing to the mix. If they knew that their two kids would lose health insurance by that, did they know that? Did they understand the implications of the vote? I mean, we, we can play to socioeconomics and we can play to education and really say that people really, I mean, I've seen some interviews of some people that basically were supporters and, and I really question like, well, why why do we allow everyone to vote? You know, for that matter. <laughs> you know, so, but, um, you know, that put aside, we're all American citizens and it is a right, you know. Um, um, did they really know? One could say yes or no, but I'm just a firm, having been a victim of hate crimes, having been, having witnessed hate crimes, you know, having defended people in the LGBT community, being a member of the state where my, my legislative body governor snuck in in the middle of the night and passed an HB2 law, you know, um, watching this state go from blue to red over a series of this eight year period, which is a buildup of that resentment of that Oval Office. You know, when you see things like this and you've lived this life, and, and I can characteristically say I did not turn 25 yesterday, so I've had enough years to digest some of this stuff, it just plays to a notion that hate can drive you to do the most foolish things that you would never ever do. I, I mean, look, did, did anybody read Nixon Land or Rick Perlstein? He talked about the expansion. So the city did this great expansion of the, the American sort of welfare state, right? Medicaid, Medicare, everything we we prize at social programs came about in the 60s. And what was the, the, the tool that Nixon used to, to go after it? It was the Southern strategy. It was pitting, it was pitting social programs against yeah. racial resentment. And it's no coincidence that Donald Trump said, I'm the law and the order president. If this is the Southern strategy coming back to bite us 40, 50 years later. Yeah. And so if people aren't voting against their interests. We conflated sort of the expansion of the welfare state with um, special privileges and special rights. And the fact that President Obama did the greatest post-60s expansion of the welfare state under, under the ACA, and now is, is no coincidence that, that, it, that a lot of the ire of the American right is directed at, at the ACA, which is also sort of a proxy for their feelings about race, which are 40 to 50 years old and are deeply embedded in American society. But read Nixon Land, the story is there. Want to say one thing, and then we're going to throw it open to questions. So uh, sure, I'll just say one thing quickly. Um, just um, thinking about, um, I think, why do people vote against their self-interest? I think I've been thinking a lot about um, the power of progressive movements over the past few years, um, particularly, I mean, Obama being in president, but being in the White House, but also um, the strength of the movement for Black Lives immigrant rights movements, LGBT um, games that we've made, um, I think there actually was a backlash um, against people being really afraid of, and the right using that to manipulate people um, to be afraid and to come out to vote. But I also want to um, emphasize the fact that um, there was very little focus on the communities that actually um, historically um, and traditionally vote um, for the Democrats. Um, there was very little um, organizing to turn out the vote in communities of color, and what we saw is that those voters who are just, you know, absolutely um, able to vote in the interest of all people um, did not turn out at the, at the high levels that they did um, in the last election. So for Groundswell, we, we really think about this a lot, um, and we have a voter engagement, integrated voter engagement program that supports our reproductive justice grantees in actually building the voter engagement power to be able to not just turn out voters who are unlikely voters, particularly women of color um, and trans communities, but also to engage those voters, not just once a year, not just dropping in once a year um, and saying, hey, will you come out and vote, but actually organizing those people on the issues that they care about. And we have a number of those grantees who do that work in the South. Um, I, I was gonna mention Women with a Vision, does that work in Louisiana. Um, National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health um, organizes in Florida, Texas, and Virginia, and West Virginia Free um, organizes in West Virginia. So they're able to organize in red states to really mobilize communities that are really um, very often um, ignored by traditional voter um, turnout efforts. And I think that's a really important thing for us to think about um, moving forward with elections. Okay, now I want to make sure we get the audience some time to ask questions. There's some mics there if people want to 
go up to it. I just want to point out one thing, which is which has been so striking in this election, is that during the election, we at Kaiser Health News were looking for sound bites about health or public health in the debates. It wasn't talked about. It just didn't come up. And I, and, and now that it, that the election is done, it's all over the place. So why you know why isn't that an election a, a voting issue in our country? It wasn't at all. And I think. Uh, that was the part of the, the failure to have that public groundswell of people who were clearly suffering all from health problems during the election, but the candidates were the risk. So, anyone have questions? Uh, uh, hello? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, practicing here. This is what was practicing here. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, as far as uh, why people vote against their self interest, I don't want to quote it directly, but Johnson had to be Nixon might have had but if anyone wants to look up the best quote on um, that issue, you should look up what Johnson had to say. Uh, anyway, my, my question is, um, uh, the industry tends to be the stepchild in you know, this kind of discussion. And, uh, I've Can written, you get a little closer to the mic? I've, I've written about the importance of dentistry in, in general health and in public health in general, uh, centering around education. And what are the prospects? Uh, okay, Medicaid has uh, a dental component, but Medicare has none, and ACA had none, very little. Uh, so what are the prospects of incorporating uh, some sort of uh, comprehensive dental care in Medicare and uh, in the future uh, of ACA? I mean, uh, the single payer, that, that failed not only because of the Republicans, because of the Blue Dog Democrats put a stop to single payer in the summer of 2009. Um, so that's my question. What, what, what are the prospects for dentistry? Thank you. Anyone want to answer? I mean, I, I don't know the answer. I think it's an excellent question, and I think it's absolutely time for that kind of visionary approach. I'm, Sorry, not optimistic. Um, you, know, you know, even in Canada, where we have single parent health care, we joke that Medicare protects you from the neck down. You know, so anything, dentistry, eyes, nose, ears, forget it. So even the precedents aren't very good. But I think, you know, I agree with those who think now's the time to, to go for growth. But this is also an economic justice issue. Who read the Barbara Aaron Wright book about integrating people about? not having teeth and being ashamed to go to job interviews. I think if you talk about it, not as about getting a, getting your cavity well, filled, but as, the elderly is, is no, no, but if, I think you talk about it not just as, as about expanding health insurance to include dentistry, but to say it's an economic justice issue, it's a racial justice issue, and that's the way to do it in my mind. And I think that's one of the things I was asking about. We have this narrow view of health, and you know, gosh, if, I, if we're not going to even include teeth and hearing aids or you know, how are we going to include education and, you know, feeding? Got a long way to go. So this was touching on a little bit, but um, I think a lot of people felt they marked over the last four years and by the recent uh, election cycle. And so are there any programs that you're aware of, or do you have any ideas for addressing that problem of people feeling like they've been ignored and locked out? And what got us where we are now? I mean, I think um, I think that is kind of the heart of the matter is folks not feeling like even with the change that they saw everything they needed to, to see. And um, I, I think this issue of bringing it local and starting and centering people at the heart of movements is the only way to address that. Um, I do think we've had a fundamentally um, broken political process in the last eight years. It's also made this. I mean, I think for me, when I look at, at where we are, you know, in this sort of um, rise against elitism, you know, you, you have a, 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 a block of, a political block that for seven years has railed against the health care bill and it's two months let it unravel and have no real proposal for 
or what to do next, right? I mean, it's the heart of sort of something that is not working and it, it's not based on, you know, the, the turn towards real people's lives and needs. So I, I do think this move to, to be local and, and heart, you know, ground things in the community mm -hmm. is, is, is the only way to move forward in that. But we've had a culture that there's the undeserving poor. Google Clinton gave it started at the top of Google Clinton. It's one. We have no poverty, no Democrats and Republicans like have no way to deal with the poor in the US, right? And so if you're in West Virginia or you're in Bridgeport, Connecticut, you're both left out. Um, and it, both parties really have no agenda to, to help. Yeah, and I think one of the things, if, if there's a silver lining, uh, maybe that um, it's clear that none of this is going to get resolved in Washington. Um, and a lot of it could be done at a state level. I mean, we're seeing a, a lot more experimentation with all kinds of uh, health plans, health programs. But part of what you're talking about in North Carolina, uh, people are saying, well, this is clearly not, you know, Washington isn't going to take care of this, particularly now. So um, I think this kind of local state and hyper local approach could be really a promising. My question is, um, so I think the bill last week, we saw a bill that sort of came at all of us in the health community. But I think in the next round, in the next attempt down the road, what happens when uh, they come at us and sort of use this divide and conquer uh, tactic again? What happens when they cut deals for the elderly groups or the sort of special disease populations? I think this question is directed at funders who fund advocacy or who are looking to fund advocacy, but as well as the advocates themselves who sort of have to or take these sweet deals or sort of put me with their members and sort of get these deals placed and it's, it's hard to turn down, but how do we resist down the road to, to sort of come together? I don't fund anything. <laughs> <laughs> Not even my kids anymore. So. <laughs> yeah, I, um, there are a lot of funders in the room, so. I invite any of them to respond. I think we're already seeing it. Um, you know, certainly in the area of international development assistance, it's divide and conquer, right? It's pit this against that, HIV against reproductive health, against migration, against, you know. So, and it absolutely has the potential to divide movements. And I think a funding strategy um, to address that, it involves compromise. And in some ways, it butts up against this idea that funders often fetishize, which is this, this notion of strategy, right? Well, that's not in our strategy to do that. Um, and well, you know, it may not be in your strategy to fund environmental justice, but the fate of global health and environmental justice are inextricably linked from each other, so you fixate on your strategy at your peril. And, and I say that with a great deal of humility as a funder that you know, has not <laughs> built those bridges at all. Uh, and I think we have to be very honest with ourselves about it. So it is going to involve a long process of getting out of silos that we probably don't have time to go through. So you know, you pick off instead of really producing um, the best bill possible to get things through Congress, you you do a bunch of deals, and I think that's really a dangerous strategy for for those of us looking at kind of the global. global I, I will say just to you know play the role of a little bit of an optimist on, on this panel. <laughs> um, uh, I, I've seen less of that than I was worried about. Seeing so far, and I think it's because I, what we're seeing is almost uh, people under shock um, uh, of just the onslaught of what is coming down. So I, I do feel much more sense of um, you know, impetus to work together, to be, to think collectively about an approach. Um, you know, I think I, I do think one of the challenges is um, in doing the advocacy. I mean, I'll speak on the global side, for instance. You know, 
all of international systems is completely on the line. I mean, it is, and I mean, talk about an issue of populism. Like, this is something where the, the people impacted by this, and it is millions of people's lives, and it is life or death and very near-term consequences, uh, are have no vote in this process. Um, and it is very much driven through a nationalist lens that we should somehow, you know, America first, um, and, and we can sort of in our think tank universe talk about how it's all connected, but uh, you know, this notion somehow that we're not part of a global community um, is, is, I think, one of the, the greatest fallacies we're dealing with. Um, and yet, um, uh, and yet the way to do that is to preserve something called the 150 account. Well, that's really sexy. <laughs> it's gonna mobilize people to get out of <laughs> um, And let me tell you about the 150 account. Um, but it's vital, because if we don't have that, it all collapses. And I think everyone in, you know, in who works across international systems understands if we don't preserve that basic foundation and pot, it's gonna, you know. Um, but the way we talk about the 150 and talk about our commitment in this space is to talk about people whose lives are saved by HIV programs, women whose lives were saved by family planning, you know, malaria prevention. I mean, you talk about the specifics, but you, you're fighting for the whole. And I do think that's a challenge, and it has to be recalibrated at every juncture, but it is that, uh, that personal level that you can message. You just have to make sure the strategies and advocacy are fundamentally going to be aligned. Now we're only two months in, so I, you know, let's see where we get on our, you know, are we are we divided and conquered or not? But I, I will say it's been that's been less um, of a challenge than I thought it, it was. So, so one of the right. places, and I, I get what you were wrong, so the place where like they, I've seen organizing happening that isn't like this is my issue is around tomorrow Mondays in North Carolina, yeah. and to me that's the most, and this is pre-Trump, this is like. We're doing this together, and we, we stand with it. If you're like a, I'm an HIV activist, but if I cannot stand with people working on immigration on reproductive rights, forget it. You're, you're, you're some sort of weird specialist, and, and you're, you're, so I, I don't know. The North Carolina example is inspiring in many ways, but mostly because it doesn't say we're working on an issue, but we're taking the high ground, and this is what this is what good means. This is what social justice means. This is what the common good means. One thing that's fun here is I think um, after the election, Grantsville has been reaching out consistently to our grantees to ask them, what do you need? Um, how can funders be supportive in this moment? And um, we actually launched a rapid response fund before the election um, and didn't actually realize how timely that was going to be. Um, and after the election, we got a lot of requests from organizations wanting to meet with organizations of different movements and actually come together and develop strategy and move forward. So we were actually able to um, um, support um, native-led organizations across the, the US um, that were organizing folks at Standing Rock, but also in different um, parts of, of the US and actually coming together to create a national strategy moving forward under the Trump administration and work with people in environmental justice, work with people who are doing um, work around um, healthcare access and other things, and actually have those conversations. So I think as funders, we can reach out to our grantees and we can find out, are there people that you you wish you could be talking to more? Can we resource you to do that so that you actually don't leave each other behind as you are making difficult decisions moving forward? I, I wonder, you know, if I would love to see, speaking of this, you know, in every community, a, a, a community of, a, a movement of people who care about health care patients in every, you know, there are kind of these natural organizing um, structures in healthcare, care like called your local hospital system and people, <laughs> everyone who's involved in the same hospital system has the same issues if not today than tomorrow and those systems are all pretty similar in their defects so there is kind of an organizing structure if um, we figure out how to effectively use them. Yeah, civil system, that's what it's called, right? There you go. Hi, my nice name is uh, Alma Shabik, and um, so I worked with the New York Muslim Voter and Information uh, Club prior to um, when the 
2016 elections happened, uh, registering over a um, hundred um, Muslims. And one of the things is that, like we discussed a lot today about healthcare and how um, the political systems that are intact, how they have a direct impact upon how it affects the dynamics of uh, providing healthcare. Um, but it's just so difficult sometimes to even get people who are qualified um, to get registered to vote. Um, and in addition to that, they're not really informed about what they're getting themselves into. They're not really aware of how it's more than just a Democratic and Republican party. And uh, other points that were made uh, revolving around how we are not investing in these communities is very prevalent because, um, for example, me, I you, I was working with them, right? So I was getting paid, but it, I'm expected to like recruit so many volunteers when in reality they would be doing the same work, you know, as me. And, and I know that other you know organizations um, where it's not people who have the language skills. For example, like I speak Urdu, and I don't need training um, to be able to have a conversation like that, or I don't need training. Uh, to express my personality and sh uh, share, um, you know, thoughts uh, and having a conversation with how essential and critical it is for us to um, vote. But like even me, I don't know every single thing about like the Green Party or the pop. Like I, this is the first time I'm hearing about populism. Uh, what's it called? <laughs> and you know, like I, you know, we're raised with uh, the knowledge of only about like a Democratic and Republican um, party. So. Like what really can we do to be informed about like everything, you know? And it's and, and reaching like that because I feel like even I don't know. Um, and I'm in like a position where you would say, yeah, like you know, you, you registered a hundred over a hundred voters or whatever it is. Um, but like, have I like when I could have used the opportunity to really educate them and you know um, do so much more. But there's not even like resources and like the inf information that I should be like knowing is not is yeah. not there out for me to know. I think that's something that's useful to hear um, for us. I mean, I would do my plug that for healthcare you can do Kaiser Health online. And, but but um, I think you know what what were you or were you doing this through an organization? And what would have you know if there are a bunch of funders up here? What would have helped you be more effective in that role? So that's what I think everyone needs to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, but for, for the webcast, if you could yeah. step to the microphone, people can't hear you online. Oh, go back to the microphone. Yeah, yeah. 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 Come up and <laughs> So, well, I also like volunteer um, with the uh, World Science Festival annually. It's an annual um, uh, festival. Um, so one of the things they do is like they have a very simple like handbook. Something so simple as a handbook where we're even training people and investing in them so that they're educated. Like for example, all I got when you know I was hired is like, so you what are you gonna do? Is you gonna talk? And my, by the way, like I, I respect this person so much. But you know, um, <laughs> yeah. but it's just like you're having a conversation and there's not like educational components to really prepare me and for me to uh, think critically. Every single like question I would be asked on the spot is just because like like out of my own knowledge, you know, and I'm not being properly trained for that. So training people before they are actually on the, uh, you know, how do you say, front lines. Yes, uh, on the front line of uh, getting people registered to vote and not like like I look like a trustworthy person. So you know some people will ask, so who would you vote for? And I'll be like, you know, like, this is what I think it. And it's such a heavy, like, responsibility, you know? And I feel like I wasn't saying the right answer. I could have, like, you know, had a better discussion. So handbooks, I think, think is one. And then also, like, not expecting everybody, like, volunteer work is great, you know? But then I question, like, even me, like, although I know I can easily recruit people um, who would, would be willing to volunteer just because they respect me a lot, I don't think it's fair that 
I'm getting registered, yeah. people registered to vote, and I'm getting paid, and then I'm like, oh yeah, you go into volunteer work. Like, what? I'm not, like, as a human, I'm, we're equal. Like, we're, it doesn't right. matter what their age well, is. Well, I think it's you know, the kind of work. grassroots help yeah, and great. organizing and focus that every, you know, that you look like you're ready to say something. Yeah, I mean, I think that, thank you for sharing um, your experience. Um, oh. <laughs> um, and I think for me, this just really underlies like how important it is to be investing in uh, particularly uh, communities of color-led organizations, women of color-led organizations that are going out and talking to communities about voting, about other issues, right? Um, and to invest in them not just to do that voter engagement um, work, but to do their ongoing work of training people, getting volunteers involved, and then giving them resources so they can actually staff up. So that in the next election, we're actually seeing record turnout of communities of color because we're actually reaching the people that are not being reached, right? Um, and that is actually going to take resources. And those organizations need funding to do that. Um, so I think that, thank you for just bringing that to this room. It's such a great example of what's needed. Yeah, and I think that's a perfect way, um, I could talk about this forever, but to end our session. And uh, um, uh, Alyssa is um, going to come give us a, a goodbye message. Um, <laughs> that and, makes it sound much more interesting. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you.